comets are something we can predict. In 1705, a time when many people thought that comets were supernatural omens, Edmund Halley called his shot. He had been cataloging numerous comets and concluded that they followed a natural, predictable pattern. The same comet was returning to Earth every 76 years. And he predicted that this comet would return following a particular orbit in the sky in 1758. When this prediction was confirmed, it demonstrated the awesome predictive power that science can hold. Earthquakes are something we can't predict. The year is now 2017, and the US loses over $4 billion a year to earthquake damage. And sure, we know generally where they're likely to show up. That's why this building has seismic protection. <laughs> but as Nate Silver discusses in his recent book, earthquakes are chaotic. We still don't know when or where a specific earthquake is going to occur with any useful level of accuracy. What about romantic attraction? Is attraction predictable like a comet? where certain combinations of people's traits and preferences predictably, reliably result in attraction? Or is attraction chaotic like an earthquake, where we just don't know when or where it's going to show up? How many people here are currently on the dating scene? <laughs> it kind of sucks, right? I mean, some people really like dating in the same way that some people really like shopping. You don't even need to be looking for anything in particular. You just like to browse. <laughs> but for those of us type A people who just want to get in, find our perfect partner, and get back out, dating can be exhausting. You have these experiences where you're on a date with someone who looked great on paper, and you're turning down the dessert menu and asking for the check because he's been talking about his collection of fantasy swords since the soups arrived, and you've yet to get a word in edgewise. Or she's literally swiping for new matches while sitting right across from you. <laughs> and if you're type A like me, you're thinking, there has got to be a way to streamline this process. Do I have to kiss all the frogs? Can't I just jump cut to the part where I actually connect with someone? That's the allure of matching algorithms. Technology does the hard work for you. You just fill out some questionnaires about who you are and what you like, and voila, here are some people you'll actually click with. You get to get in, find your perfect partner, and get back out. It's a really alluring concept, so much so that people are willing to pay a lot of money for the service. But are matchmaking algorithms actually feasible? Is attraction like a comet? Well, when we're talking about prediction, we have to talk about precision. How much of attraction can we predict? Because predicting all of it with perfect accuracy is a really big ask, unreasonably big. But predicting some of attraction Having at least a vague sense of whether two people will like each other or not is a much smaller, more reasonable ask. All that's required is that people actually like the things they say they like. <laughs> let's, let's say I'm filling out an online questionnaire, and I say that I like men who like puppies and are clean-shaven and like to go surfing on the weekends, and an algorithm pairs me with this guy. Am I actually more attracted to him than I would be to this guy? <laughs> because if I am, that means that attraction is at least a little bit predictable, which means that matchmaking algorithms could be at least a little bit helpful. I'm a relationships researcher, and for a long time, my field has implicitly assumed that this was a done deal. Of course, people like the things they say they like, and when you conduct hypothetical studies, say, by presenting people with dating profiles and asking them to imagine who they'd pick, they do tend to pick the kinds of things they say they'd pick. If I say I like surfer puppy guys, and you show me these profiles, of course I'm going to pick the guy on the left. But then 
researchers started doing studies with real potential partners, real matching. And things started to get a little weird. Because people would have all these requirements for what they wanted in a partner. They'd have their preferences and their deal breakers. And then as soon as you presented them with a real potential partner, all of those things would go right out the window. <laughs> I conducted a study where I presented people with a potential partner who had at least two of their personal deal breakers, things they had explicitly said they did not want in a partner. <laughs> and can you guess what percentage agreed to go on the date anyway? It was 74%. <laughs> So studies like these begin to cast some doubt. But they don't fully test our question of whether matching is possible. They don't fully answer the question of whether attraction is like a comet or an earthquake. My colleagues, Paul Eastwick, Eli Finkel, and I tried to get at this question in a more systematic way recently using speed dating studies. Single undergraduate students paired with each other for a series of four minute speed dates. Beforehand, they completed a large package of questionnaires about their traits and their preferences. These are some examples. We had over 100 traits and preferences. And then we used machine learning to see if we could predict who liked who. Specifically, we used the random forests method, which randomly samples different combinations of traits and preferences thousands of times to try to predict attraction as accurately as possible. So what did we find? Well, we found we could predict people's general tendencies to like others at up to 18% accuracy. So some people are choosier than others, and our models could pick up on that. We could also predict people's general tendencies to be liked, who's hot and who's not, up to 27% accuracy. So some people are more attractive than others, and again, our models could detect that. But then we get to relationship level attraction. And this is the part we really care about. Can we predict which pairs of individuals are particularly well suited or well matched? And here our models were completely useless. <laughs> we could not predict attraction to a specific person at all. In either of our two studies, using over 100 traits and preferences. So, Let's come back to this idea of online dating for a minute. Now, websites like eHarmony and Chemistry.com claim that they can use algorithms to match people together, scientific algorithms. But they haven't actually let any scientists see these algorithms. <laughs> They're proprietary knowledge. We can't share them. They say, just trust us. OK. We can see what they measure, the questionnaires that go into the algorithms. But we don't know how they use those measures. We don't know what the algorithms are. Is it my self-esteem combined with your outgoingness? Is it your spirituality plus my neuroticism? <laughs> my political views plus your allergy to bees? <laughs> we don't know. The exciting thing about machine learning is that it allows us to test for the first time all of the combinations of all the traits and preferences we measured. So whichever combinations work to predict attraction, we should have picked up on it. And we found nothing. Now, is this because this was an undergraduate sample? Maybe the models would have worked with a more mature sample. Maybe. Is it because people only met each other for a few minutes, and the models could have worked if we had longer for the attraction to unfold? Maybe. Or maybe attraction is not like a comet. It might not be the case that we can take one person who has trade X and another person who likes trade X, and boom, attraction happens. We might just not know what we're going to be drawn to in another person until we actually experience that person, until we physically go out and meet that person. Attraction might be chaotic, like an earthquake, or we just don't know when or where it's going to show up. So if we're this confused about what we want, how are we ever supposed to find that ideal person? 
if the things we're looking for in the long term have virtually no bearing on what we're attracted to in the short term, how are we ever supposed to select that perfect person? Well, there might be something a bit off about that very question. Because dating websites and apps have us approaching dating like a kind of consumerism, with the goal being to select the ideal partner. But studies like mine and many others suggest that what matters most in a relationship isn't so much your combinations of traits and preferences, but rather the experiences that you share, the ways that you behave around each other and toward each other. And so maybe we shouldn't be so laser focused on who the person is we're choosing, but rather the relationship we're building. Are we building the kind of relationship where we celebrate each other's successes, support each other's goals, treat each other with compassion, communicate honestly about our needs, and then strive to meet those needs? What steps are we taking to create the environment that will nurture the kind of relationship we want. In the words of my mentor, Jeff McDonald, maybe the key to a successful relationship isn't so much finding the right partner as it is being the right partner. Thank you. <laughs>